So today I'll be talking about our motivation for doing this work, um, who makes up a relatively new group at OICR, the Clinical Cancer Genome Interpretation Team. I'll discuss some tools for genome interpretation, um, walk us through an, ex an example case, and we can point to our next direction. Um, so when looking at next generation sequencing, um, this has allowed us to query genomes at a massive um, scale, and we're generating large and um, larger and larger amounts of, of, of data. Um, where we were once um, tr treating patients just based on the tumor or cancer type, um, we can now create informed decisions based on the mutation profile of, uh, of each patient with the ultimate goal being clinical actionability. Um, for example, in a case of lung adenocarcinoma where there have been um, serial biopsies with tumor profiling, each of these biopsies can, um, be, in, in, can be used to inform treatment. Um, so in the first case, there, there is a, a, a host of, of FDA-approved tr tr treatments available um, to the physician, and in, the, in sample two, the second biopsy, uh, a resistance mutation is, ob is, ob is observed, and again, based on the genetic profile, there are, there are options available uh, to the physician. Now, um, it wouldn't be a bioinformatics talk if we didn't uh, have a look at this wonderful um, slide, um, and ultimately... Just to say this is the second time in the past hour and a half. <laughs> it gets, it's so, I was put onto the slide and I thought, ah, of course. Um, so we're creating all the data that's available to us as bioinformaticians and it's cheaper and cheaper to sequence. However, what they don't tell us is that, the, well, this might just be how I feel, but it's a real the cost for an analysis could get out of control if we don't uh, look at efficient ways to um, really analyze all the data that we are generating. So we have to um, work to efficiently curate clinically meaningful mutations that can be targeted for treatment among the many mutations um, that are found in the genome. Um, because this is now seemingly our mutation uh, bottleneck. And what we are looking for is driver mutations, which is any um, alteration previously known to cause cancer, as well as actionable mutations, uh, which may have a clearly defined course of action. So my background here is I started at OICR as a bioinformatician working in the Translational Genomics Laboratory under Dr. Trevor Pugh. Um, and, and here we did population or, or cohort level studies um, where we worked with different um, collaborators in the community to do population level st studies. Uh, there's a bit of a new st structure here at OICR, which many of us are aware of. Um, Trevor is now the director of genomics and he takes care of Princess Margaret Genomics, the OICR Genomics Research Platform, and the Translational Genomics Lab. And I guess my group sits uh, somewhere in, in there. I hope I got it correct. Um, and this is all encompassing uh, genome sequence informatics. So again, what we're hoping to do is where once the research team uh, studied cancer from the cohort level, identifying novel prognostic markers, we now aim to take all that we have learned um, to create a CAF accredited report, which can be signed out by our director, um, Dr. Trevor Pugh. So this team will uh, review clinically generated reports. Uh, we're going to work with clinical geneticists uh, to help them to better understand the, um, the data. And we're going to work to continuously identify bottlenecks uh, so, so we can try our best to streamline the genomic interpretation uh, process. Um, and I guess I would have clicked on that a bit earlier. Here is, we're aiming to create a clinical report. Um, 
So this is a grossly oversimplified version of what uh, a pipeline might look like. I actually took out all the tools um, so that we can focus on, um, if you've ever heard someone in our group talk before, you might hear about these things we call uh, blue boxes. These are the interpretable com components, which are, we are really focused on analyzing and distilling down as efficiently as we can into a report that will be uh, clinically meaningful for, for both the patient and the, phys and the physician. Uh, so we're looking at things like mutation burden, um, different som somatic mutations, mutation signatures, um, fusions, and I'll get more into what some of these mean in a bit later. But on top of the um, these interpretable components, which are output from the different bioinformatic tools, um, there's a there's a two other other things which we need, which I'll be expanding on. We're looking at a reporting software, and we're also looking at um, a knowledge base, which is kind of a curated collection of of all the mutations, as as well as different therapies or clinical trials, and also um, our experience gained from past sequencing. Um, so to do this, we've been looking at the different um, interpretation practices in the in the field, and generally, um, what we've reviewed is that uh, there's usually a a gene panel of what's been determined to be a clinically um, relevant set of maybe 100 to, to 500 genes. Um, there would be a step reviewing patient history, a step looking at um, biological and technical QC, um, and I'll, I'll expand what I mean by that a bit later, and also um, a a, a a review of the genomic landscape. Um, this could be really um, any set of oncogenic somatic mutations or resistance markers, um, whether they're single nucleotide variants or, in, or indels, um, as well as recommendations for treatment and clinical trials. And this is where we've sort of started to um, grow what we are choosing to do from. And they all tend to have a relatively consistent format I've put up uh, two options here, um, one from Foundation One and one from the Garden360 group. I think we looked at these last week uh, or last month, um, the speaker from the AO Monday talk, um, and these are both gene panels of different sizes, again, from one to about 500 genes. There's a consistent format here with the patient and sample information at the beginning, and then it gets into um, uh, specific mutations which are found in this sample, um, and it would detail um, therapeutic implications where appropriate. Um, these commercially available panels, they do an excellent job of solving um, well-studied cancer types, such as EGFR activating mutations in lung adenocarcinoma, but these are only um, clinically impactful in a subset of patients, and this is why we are pl planning to expand this field to include uh, whole genome and whole transcriptome sequencing. Um, one gr group which we think did do an excellent job is the Personalized Oncogenomics Group um, at the BC Cancer Agency. Um, they've created an integrated pipeline um, report, and we've worked with them a, a lot to inf inform the direction that our platform um, wants to go. Um, um, again, it takes a similar approach with patient information and going into mutations, and their platform does take it a step f f further, looking at um, a whole transcriptome, um, as well as fusions and some ex some expanded information on quality control and um, cellularity. Um, a lot of this, it wasn't, in, in fact, um, in-house scripts and wasn't um, terribly portable. So we are working to go our own direction with this. And when we, when I say this would be an, an example of our new plan, so an example in addition to the three steps which I discussed um, earlier, we're hoping to expand what's traditionally done in the community 
with um, integrated use of copy number variation and expression analysis, as well as looking at structural alterations and fusions, and then ultimately transcriptome analysis, looking at different um, clinically um, important pathways where we can then put this all together into a report which can be passed on to a physician. So why is the current um, use of, of a smaller panel? Maybe that's not the best approach. Um, with whole genome sequencing, we can more accurately estimate um, tumor mutation burden. Obviously, we have the largest handful across the entire genome. Uh, we can more accurately determine tumor mutation signatures, which are important in a, in a variety of cancer types. And we, we can look at identifying novel mutations in um, oncogenes, which aren't explicitly found in the um, exons of what's frequently inc included in a smaller panel, looking at mutations in promoters and regulatory regions. As far as um, why it's important to include whole transcriptome sequencing, um, we can characterize novel fusions, we can characterize the immune landscape of a tumor sample, and we can work to ident identify cancer pathway activity. Um, so what this might look like when we put it all together, we would get a, requ a request from a, a hospital or one of our collaborators. Uh, we would, this would undergo a whole genome and whole transcriptome sequencing. Um, the pipelines here at OSCR would do a lot of the crunching. Um, and then with a knowledge base, um, which I'll speak to momentarily, as well as clinical um, informa information required for proper interpretation fed in from a red calf inst instance. Um, our group, um, as well as some other clinical molecular geneticists would get to get together um, to create a, uh, a, re a report, which can be signed out by Dr. Pugh and um, passed on to the physician to ultimately, uh, ho hopefully, um, best informed patient care. So this knowledge base that I've been speaking to, too, um, I guess it's a topic that we frequently came across when we're kind of looking as to how best to do this. Um, the, traditionally, we've used databases such as HIVIC or OncoKB, My Cancer Genome. There really is a, uh, a, a host of, of options av available out, out there, but but we're looking at ways to best um, um, collate this all to, to get together as obviously the uh, scope way of looking at clinically important mutations um, can be extremely large. Um, in addition, um, we've had a lot of success um, in the past here at my working group um, using the vast amounts of genomic data that we've created to um, create aggregate st statistics where we can look at different outliers. Um, we've created blacklists for um, sequencing artifacts. Um, and that's how to best do this is still um, an important topic which we are working on. Um, so now I want to demonstrate what this application might look like in a um, clinical case. Um, and this is a case that um, may not have been resolved um, with the traditional approach of looking at a smaller gene panel. Um, so this is a female case, um, 52 years old with um, um, ovarian cancer. Um, and the first step that, that we would do is review the patient's history. Here we look at um, important information like clinical history, um, cancer type, and previous treatment, as this would all uh, help us orient our scope for interpretation. Um, the second step, we would look at biological and technical QC. Um, here we would look at metrics such as coverage and contamination, and we would flag unexpected mutations, um, such as uh, unexpected mutations, which may um, identify things like a sample sw swap or whether or not the mutation um, is a outlier for a given um, cancer type. Uh, the next step, we would look at 
the genomic landscape. Um, this is a screenshot from C Bio Portal where we host um, a lot of our mutations, a lot of our cases, and make them uh, publicly available to the uh, requesting physician. And in this case, we can see that no um, oncogenic mutations are observed. Um, so that's why it's important to continue this beyond just looking at um, some somatic mutations and integrate um, copy number variation and expression analysis. Um, so in this plot down at the bottom, we can see that um, it's a plot of a copy number track on the bottom and um, Z score exp expression on the Y axis. And we can see that there's overexpression of some um, clinic, potentially clinically relevant genes. Um, Breb and LAMP one, and these can help us to drive a hypothesis for further analysis. So based on these findings, um, we can make a prediction um, of which cancer pathways are potentially in, involved. So we can see that Breb and, and LAMP one are upregulated, and these are um, important um, kinases in the mTOR pathway. And from here, we can then design different experiments um, to test our, our hypotheses. So a next step for, for this might be looking at gene set in, in, in enrichment and en then analysis to see um, if the mTOR pathway um, could in fact be involved. Uh, so gene set in enrichment and en en analysis, it looks for signatures of whether or not um, certain pathways may be um, significantly um, activa activated or, de or deactivated in a given sample. Um, and this, um, in, in, in this case, we can see that there is good evidence um, that mTOR signaling is in involved. And as a result, uh, we could make a suggestion to a clinician that um, uh, that this uh, mTOR-based um, upregulation uh, could be a uh, significant um, player in this cancer type. And then obviously this would be up to the physician as to how to best use this information. Uh, so now I just want to quickly discuss um, how we, some um, more about these newer tools and, and how we want to incorporate this approach um, into our work. Uh, so the first would be looking at, uh, I, as, I met, met, as I mentioned, integrated copy number variation and expression analysis. Um, we're particularly interested in copy number changes, which have an, an accompanied um, change in expression. And we're also interested in looking at um, truncating mutations where there is a loss of expression. And again, um, it's still quite a manual process, but these can be um, clues to help to help drive our hypotheses for um, for further pathway analysis. Um, this is a plot um, from a tool called Vibrotic, which we are working on. Um, and it was worked on a lot by John, who's in our group, as well as our Waterloo <laughs> co-op student, Tyed. Um, and it plots um, copy number res results against um, the Z score. Uh, so the next thing we're interested in applying is looking at and characterizing um, st structural alterations and fusions. Um, for this, we're using a tool called, called Mavis, which can connect structural variant callers from our whole genome sequencing workflow with fusion candidates from our whole transcriptome workflow. And um, in this way, um, we can validate net novel fusions without too much work for the downstream um, validation as it can merge the um, annotations and we can get evidence from both pipelines. Uh, we're also interested in integrating transcriptome analysis and we're looking at a variety of ways to best um, implement this. One such way we're looking at implementing uh, transcriptome analysis is through a RNA-seq uh, tumor classifier. Uh, this is, was primarily worked on by Al Alberto, who works in our research group. Uh, this may be used for quality con control, 
uh, as um, to ensure that it's the cancer type that we are interested in investigating, because um, uh, you know misclassification could potentially ch change our interpretation dramatically. And it's also a functional check to see if the data is well formed for our further downstream analysis. Um, and we're also interested in investigating in um, looking at a variety of other expression outliers, um, pathway analysis, as I mentioned earlier, as well as immune inference. And as we aim to continually de develop and evaluate different tools, uh, we, we, we hope that we can incorporate um, more of, of these practices into our um, CAF validated report and workflow, uh, such as making comments on the immune profile um, and the different um, cancer pathways which are potentially involved for a given uh, tumor sample. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody from the genome team. Um, it's a, now a much larger team, I'm still getting to know every, everybody, and, um, and especially the other two members of this uh, brand new team, which is Alberto and Jonathan and myself. So thank you very much for listening to me this morning.